In the previous episode, we pretty much finished covering all of the basics of the triode. But before we move on to look at the pentode and maybe even start building some circuits with the triode, there's one more thing that I want to cover in a little more detail. And that is, how do we bias the grid? If you remember, in the previous episode, I ended up using a collection of resistors hooked up to a negative 12 volt voltage source. And that was how I ended up with a negative bias on the grid. And I did this by essentially copying what IBM had done, uh, only at much lower voltages. But there's more than one way to tackle this problem. And that's what I want to look at today. So we have four circuits on the bench that I want to look at in more detail. And uh, I think we can start to get an idea of all of the different ways that we can bias the grid on a triode. So let's hop over to the bench and take a look. So here on our breadboard, you can see that we have two vacuum tubes. Again, these are six DJ8 uh, dual triodes. Uh, so each tube has two triodes in it. And so with these two tubes, we're able to get our four circuits. And the first circuit that I want to take a look at is actually the exact same circuit that we ended up building in the previous episode. And that is, we have this uh, collection of 100,000 ohm and 10,000 ohm resistors pulling the grid to uh, a negative bias using a negative 12 volts uh, input right here. Um, and then we check our output here after we have a, a plate resistor up here the 10,000 ohm plate resistor, and our cathode is connected directly to ground. And so I want to measure two things on all four circuits uh, at both a logic low input and a logic high input. And the logic low input is 6 volts on this and logic high is 24 volts. And the two things I want to measure is I want to see exactly what the voltage on the grid is and exactly what the output voltage is. And then I'm going to write all the results down and we'll take a look at, at what changes in the end. So let's go ahead and get started. We'll go ahead and just double check that we've got our negative voltage coming in. So I'll check right here. There we go. We've got negative 12.2 volts. And just to check our positive voltage, we've got 24.1 volts on our positive voltage rail there. All right, so let's go ahead and just check our output here. So that's going to be this little green wire here. I'll check it. Um, and you can see we've got 24.1 uh, volts on the output. Uh, and if I change this to a logic high input, uh, we've got 6.95 volts. All right, and now let's take a look at what exactly the voltage is on the grid. And you can see right there, we're at 207 millivolts, uh, so 0.2 volts, um, and that is at our logic high input. And if we just uh, flip this little switch here, you can see there we go, we go to minus 3.1 uh, volt. Um, so we have on our grid, we have a voltage swing between minus 3.1 volt and 0.2 volts. All right, so that's our baseline. We'll kind of base the subsequent circuits on the results that we got from this one. So let's take a look at the second circuit, which is in this uh, triode on the right here. All right, well, this is actually the circuit that we ended up building two episodes ago. This was our most basic circuit. Uh, and you can see it's, it's pretty close, except that our logic uh, low and logic high input voltages are much, much lower. They're zero volts to six volts. And uh, instead of having a whole lot of resistors here to go to a negative 12 volts, we're pulling the grid to ground with a 100,000 ohm resistor. And then we have a 10,000 ohm resistor to kind of uh, keep this, this 6 volts from being a little too harsh on our grid here. Uh, but other than that, this, the rest of the tube is set up exactly the same. Um, so let's, let's just go ahead. Right now we're at a logic uh, low, which is 0 volt input. So let's take a look at the output. There you go, you can see we've got 14.25 volts for our output. And if I push the button, that is now a logic high input. So our output drops to 2.95 volts. So we go from 14.2 to 2.9. All right, now let's take a look at the grid. I'll put this directly on the grid there. Oh, well, no, well now that's interesting. We've got negative 230 millivolts. So we've got a negative 0.2 volts. But I mean, you can see very clearly with our, our schematic here that we don't have any negative voltage coming in. Hmm, that's interesting. Let's push the button and see what happens. Okay, we go to positive 0.4 volts. 
All right, so we've got a, a, a negative 0.2 to a positive 0.4. Hmm, that's, that's really interesting, actually. So what's going on here? Why are we seeing a negative voltage? And at first I thought maybe my, my multimeter wasn't quite reading right, but the, the answer is actually a little more complicated than that. And it comes from the fact that our grid is actually absorbing some electrons even when it's not supposed to. So we have our cathode connected up directly to ground and our cathode is being heated by our heater. So all of the elect electrons that are on our cathode are getting thrown off, but the grid is blocking them because it's pulled low. If the grid is blocking the electrons, they just kind of form a little cloud that hangs out in between the cathode and the grid. But these electrons are moving at ridiculous speeds and they're bouncing all over the place and, and they tend to hit the grid. And usually they hit the grid and bounce off, but sometimes they hit the grid and they stick. And now the grid has more electrons than the cathode. And those electrons are going to move through this pull down resistor back over to ground. So that way it can make its way back over to the cathode. So we end up in an interesting situation where we have a negative charge on the grid. Well, that's great because the more negative that the grid is, the less those electrons are going to make it to the plate. But because we're pulling the grid to ground and because we're pulling the cathode to ground, it's really not a very strong negative. As we saw, I mean, it was minus 0.2 volts. And so that leads me to the, the next circuit that I want to take a look at. And that is the grid leak bias. And you can see it's almost identical to the last circuit there's just been two changes. The resistor for our input is bumped up a lot. We went from 10K to 100K. And also, we've added a resistor between the cathode and ground. So let's go ahead and just take a measurement here and see what happens, all right? So let's, uh, we'll start with our output. So that's gonna be this guy right here. Wow, look at that, we're at, 18.8 uh, volts, that's, that's much higher. The, the previous circuit only got up to 14 volts. That's actually approaching our B plus voltage. That's pretty good. Now what happens if we push the button and we go to uh, logic high input? We should see a logic low coming out of this. We should see our output go low. And it does go low, but it doesn't go as low. Well, that's interesting. So we've got 5.5 and 18.8. All right, so let's, let's take a look at what's happening on the grid, because I think that's, that's gonna be the most interesting thing. So we'll just go ahead and plug you right there. All right, so you can see that we have 53 millivolts on the grid without any input. So if I push this button, we'll see our input. Whoa, okay, 2.59 volts. That's actually a pretty high voltage for the grid. We, we kind of don't want that. So 50 millivolts to 2.6, we'll say. But we're actually not measuring in the right place. We're measuring the grid with respect to ground. But remember, in between ground and the cathode is this 1K resistor. And the grid only cares about what's going on at the cathode. So we really need to be measuring the voltage of the grid with respect to the cathode, because the voltage here might possibly be different than the voltage here. And the grid only needs to block the difference between the cathode and the plate up here. So to measure that, I've got a, a little jumper wire here, and I'm gonna go ahead and just uh, stab that in right there, and then we'll, we'll move our voltmeter probe over to this jumper wire. And let's, let's measure the grid again. Wow, look at that. Much different, minus 0 0.54 volts. All right, so now we've got a, a larger negative bias on the grid than we did in the previous circuit. What happens if I push the button? 
360 millivolts. So we go from minus 0.5 to plus 0.3. Now that is interesting. That explains why we saw a higher voltage on the output because we're pulling the grid to a lower negative voltage using that grid leak method that we talked about. And this 1000 ohm resistor puts the cathode at a higher potential, which allows the grid to be pulled to a further negative potential with respect to the cathode. That's really cool. That's really interesting. And, and actually, this is a really common setup in amplifiers. All right, so let's take a look at our last circuit. And that is the cathode follower. Now you can see the, this setup is actually quite a lot different. We have a 100,000 ohm resistor pulling the grid to ground, and we have a really low resistor for our logic input, which is just a 1000 ohm resistor into the grid. And you can see our logic input actually is quite high. We're going from 6 volts to 24 volts. But if you look at our plate resistor, we're down to just 100 ohms, and our output doesn't come out of the plate. It comes out of the cathode, and the resistor on our cathode is huge. It's 10,000 ohms. So, well, this is potentially going to provide some really interesting differences here. So we'll hook our voltmeter back up to regular ground to measure that way. And let's just go ahead and measure the output here. And that's going to be right there. Wow, okay, so you can see that on our output we're getting 21.6 volts, and that's with a 24-volt input. So if I flip the switch, that should be a 6-volt input. And you can see we get 6.5 volts on the, on the output there as well. So whenever we have 6 volts on the input, we're getting 6 volts on the output. And if we have 24 volts on the input, we've got 21.6 volts on the output. So this is not an inverting amplifier at all. This is, this is actually more like a buffer. It's producing an output that is almost identical to the input. That's really interesting. All right, well, let's take a look at the grid. And we'll take a look at the grid first with respect to ground. So if I check right there, wow, you can see our grid is at 22 volts with respect to ground. And if we go to logic low, it's at 5.89 volts with respect to ground. Now, if you remember, I said we don't really want a large voltage on the grid because this could, well, this could cause some issues. The, the electrons can smash into the grid. But we're measuring the grid with respect to ground. Let's measure the grid with respect to the cathode and see what our result is. So we'll put you there. And again, we'll just put our little probe right here. Wow, look at the difference. All right, so 370 millivolts and negative 0.6 volts. So there you go. Our grid is not actually seeing these ridiculous voltages that we just looked at. Our grid is actually seeing a negative bias to a slight positive bias. That's really cool. That's awesome. So what's going on here? There's some really interesting things happening here. Why do we have such interesting voltages showing up on the grid despite the fact that we have such a large input going into it? Well, it's called a cathode follower for a reason, and that's because the potential of the cathode tends to follow the potential of the grid. Now we know that if the grid has a negative potential, it blocks the electrons from flowing from here to here. And if the grid has a positive potential, well, the electrons are gonna flow from here to the grid as well as here to the plate. So when this has a large positive potential, those electrons start to flow. But this 10,000 ohm resistor means that we start to pull this to a high voltage because we have a really small resistor up here. So the cathode starts to become closer and closer to the plate voltage up here. But if that potential gets too high, the grid starts to become negative with respect to the cathode. And then that starts to block those electrons from flowing through again. And as we change this grid potential up and down, the voltage potential with respect to the cathode 
changes. And then that causes the potential of the cathode to move up and down along with it. Now, one of the great things about this is that the voltage that's coming in through here, through our tube and then out our outputs, only passing through a little 100 ohm resistor. So we have much more oomph coming out of this. We can drive much heavier loads than we can with the inverting amplifier. Because if we look at the inverting amplifier, you can see we have that 10,000 ohm resistor here. So no matter what our output is, it first goes through 10,000 ohms of, of current limiting resistance. Well, on the cathode follower, that current limiting resistance is only 100 ohms because it passes through and comes out here. So this is a really neat way to build a buffer with a vacuum tube. So a lot of times you can have your inverting amplifier giving you an inverting output, and then you can buffer it through one of these to drive a heavier load. And so those are the four different ways that I personally have been experimenting with biasing the grid of vacuum tubes. And I, I think the results that we got here are really interesting. If you, if you look at the numbers, which should be up on the screen, the, you can see that no matter what setup we had, we always had a little bit of negative voltage at the grid. And that's just because of the way that grid leak biasing works. That's, that's really cool. That's a really interesting way to think about the flow of electrons within the tube. And this is, this is awesome. All right. So these are some of the ways that we can use triodes and some of the ways that we will use triodes in the future.